Chapter 19 of the Border Legion by Zane Gray. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The weary, dusty cavalcade halted on the level bench before the bandit's cabin. Golden boomed the salute to Kells. The other men shouted greeting. In the wild exaltation of triumph, they still held him as chief. But Kells was not deceived. He even passed by that heavily laden, gold-weighted saddle. He had eyes only for Joan. "'Girl, I never was so glad to see anyone,' he exclaimed, in husky amaze. "'How did it happen? I never—' Jim Cleve leaned over to interrupt Kells. "'It was great, Kells, that idea of yours, putting us in the stagecoach you meant to hold up,' said Cleve with a swift, meaning glance but it nearly was the end of us. You didn't catch up. The gang didn't know we were inside, and they shot that old stage full of holes. Ah, so that's it, replied Kell slowly. But the main point is, you brought her through, Jim. I can't ever square that. Oh, maybe you can, laughed Cleve, as he dismounted. Suddenly, Kells became aware of Joan's exhaustion and distress. "'Joan, you're not hurt?' he asked, in swift anxiety. "'No, only played out. "'You look it. Come.' He lifted her out of the saddle, and half carrying, half leading her, took her into the cabin, and through the big room to her old apartment. How familiar it seemed to Joan. A ground squirrel frisked along a chink between the logs, chattering welcome. The place was exactly as Joan had left it. Kells held Joan a second, as if he meant to embrace her, but he did not. Lord, it's good to see you. I never expected to again. But you can tell me all about yourself after you rest. I was just having breakfast. I'll fetch you some. Were you alone here? asked Joan. Yes, I was with Bate and Handy. Hey, Kells, roared the gang from the outer room. Kells held aside the blanket curtain so that Joan was able to see through the door. The men were drawn up in a half-circle round the table, upon which were the bags of gold. Kells whistled low. Joan, there'll be trouble now, he said. But don't you fear, I'll not forget you. Despite his undoubted sincerity, Joan felt a subtle change in him, and that, coupled with the significance of his words, brought a return of the strange dread. Kells went out and dropped the curtain behind him. Joan listened. Share and share alike, boomed the giant Golden. Say, called Kells gaily, aren't you fellows going to eat first? Shouts of derision greeted his sally. I'll eat gold dust, added Bud. Have it your own way, men, responded Kells. Blicky, get the scales down off that shelf. Say, I'll bet anybody... I have the most dust by sundown. Many shouts of derision were flung at him. Who wants to gamble now? Boss, I'll take that bet. <laughs> you won't look so bright by sundown. Then followed a moment's silence, presently broken by a clink of metal on the table. Boss, how do you ever get wind of this big shipment of gold? asked Jesse Smith. I had it spotted, but Handy Oliver was the scout. We'll sure drink the handy, exclaimed one of the bandits. And who was sending out this shipment, queried the curious Smith. Them bags are marked all the same. It was a one-man shipment, replied Kells, sent out by the boss miner of Alder Creek. They call him Overland something. The name brought Joan to her feet with a thrilling fire. Her uncle, old Bill Hodley, was called Overland. Was it possible that the bandits meant him? It could hardly be. The name was a common one in the mountains. Sure, I'd seen Overland lots of times, said Bud, and he's got wise to my watching him. Somebody tipped it off that the Legion was after his gold, went on Kells. I suppose we have Pierce to thank for that. But it worked out well for us. The hell we raised there at the lynching must have thrown a scare into Overland. He had nerve enough to try to send his dust to Bannock on the very next stage. He nearly got away with it, too, for it was only 
lucky accident that Handy heard the news. The name Overland drew Joan like a magnet, and she arose to take her old position where she could peep in upon the bandits. One glance at Jim Cleve told her that he, too, had been excited by the name. Then it occurred to Joan that her uncle could hardly have been at Alder Creek without Jim knowing it. Still, among thousands of men, all wild and toiling and self-sufficient, hiding their identities, anything might be possible. After a few moments, however, Joan leaned to the improbability of the man being her uncle. Kell sat down before the table, and Blicky stood beside him with the gold scales. The other bandits lined up opposite. Jim Cleve stood to one side, watching, brooding. "'You can't weigh it all on these scales,' said Blicky. "'That's sure,' replied Kells. "'We'll divide the small bags first. Ten shares, ten equal parts. Spill out the bags, Blick, and hurry. Look how hungry Golden looks. Somebody cook your breakfast while we divide the gold. Ha-ha! <laughs> Oh-ho! Who wants to eat?' The bandits were gay, derisive, scornful, eager, like a group of boys, half surly, half playful, at a game. "'Well, I sure want to see my share, Wade,' drawled Bud. Kells moved, his gun flashed. He slammed it hard upon the table. "'Bud, do you question my honesty?' he asked, quick and hard. "'No offense, boss. I was just talking. That quick change of Kells's marked the subtle difference in the spirit of the bandits and the occasion. Gaiety and good humor and badinage ended. There were no more broad grins or friendly leers or coarse laughs. Golden and his groups clustered closer to the table, quiet, intense, watchful, suspicious. It did not take Kells and his assistant long to divide the smaller quantity of the gold. Here, Golden, he said, and he handed the giant a bag. Jesse, Bossert, Pike, Beatty, Braverman, Blicky. Here, Jim Cleve, get in the game, he added, throwing a bag at Jim. It was heavy. It hit Jim with a thud and dropped to the ground. He stooped to reach it. That leaves one for Handy and one for me, went on Kells. Blicky, spill out the big bag. Presently, Joan, saw a huge mound of dull, gleaming yellow. The color of it leaped to the glinting eyes of the bandits, and it seemed to her that a shadow hovered over them. The movements of Kells grew tense and hurried. Beads of sweat stood out upon his brow. His hands were not steady. Soon larger bags were distributed to the bandits. That broke the waiting, the watchfulness, but not the tense eagerness. The bandits were now like leashed hounds. Bicky leaned before Kells and hit the table with his fist. "'Boss, I've a kick coming,' he said. "'Come on with it,' replied the leader. "'Ain't Golden a-going to divide up that big nugget?' "'He is, if he's square.' A chorus of affirmatives from the bandits strengthened Kells's statement. Golden moved heavily and ponderously, and he pushed some of his comrades aside to get nearer to Kells. "'Wasn't it my right to do a job by myself when I wanted?' he demanded. "'No. I agreed to let you fight when you wanted, to kill a man when you liked. That was the agreement. What I'd kill a man for?' No one answered that in words, but the answer was there in dark faces. "'I know what I meant,' continued Golden, "'and I'm going to keep this nugget.' There was a moment's silence. It boded ill to the giant. So he declares himself, said Blicky hotly. Boss, what you say goes. Let him keep it, declared Kells scornfully. I'll win it from him and divide it with the gang. That was received with hoarse acclaims by all except Golden. He glared sullenly. Kells stood up and shook a long finger in the giant's face. I'll win your nugget, he shouted. I'll beat you at any game. I call your hand. Now, if you've got any nerve. Come on, boomed the giant, and he threw his gold down upon the table with a crash. 
the bandits closed in around the table with sudden hard violence all crowding for seats i'm a going to set in the game yelled blicky we'll all set in declared jesse smith come on was golden acquiescence but we all can't play at once protested kells let's make up two games nah some of you eat then while the others get cleaned out that's it cleaned out ejaculated bud meanly you seem to be sure kells and i guess i'll keep shady of that game that's twice for you bud flashed the bandit leader beware of the third time hey fellas cut the cards for who sets in and who sets out called blicky and he slapped a deck of cards upon the table with grim eagerness as if drawing lots against fate the bandits bent over and drew cards bud braverman and beardy jones were the ones excluded from the game beady you fellas unpack those horses and turn them loose and bring the stuff inside said kells bud showed a surly disregard but the other two bandits got up willingly and went out then the game began with only cleve standing looking on the bandits were mostly silent they moved their hands and occasionally bent forward it was every man against his neighbor. Golden seemed implacably indifferent and played like a machine. Blicky sat eager and excited under a spell. Jesse Smith was a slow, cool, shrewd gambler. Bossard and Pike, two ruffians, almost unknown to Joan, appeared carried away by their opportunity. And Kells began to wear that strange, rapt, weak expression that gambling gave him. Presently, B.D. Jones and Braverman bustled in, carrying the packs. Then Bud jumped up and ran to them. He returned to the table, carrying a demijohn, which he banged upon the table. Whiskey, exclaimed Kells, take that away. We can't drink and gamble. Watch me, replied Blicky. Let them drink, Kells, declared Golden. We'll get their dust quicker, then we can have our game. Kells made no more comment. The game went on, and the aspect of it changed. When Kells himself began to drink, seemingly unconscious of the fact, Joan's dread increased greatly, and leaving the peephole, she lay back upon the bed. Always a sword had hung over her head. Time after time, by some fortunate circumstance, or by courage or wit, or by an act of providence, she had escaped what strangely menaced. Would she escape it again? For she felt the catastrophe coming. Did Jim recognize the fact? Remembering the look on his face, she was assured that he did. Then he would be quick to seize upon any possible chance to get her away, and always he would be between her and those bandits. At most, then, she had only death to fear, death that he would mercifully deal to her if the worst came and as she lay there listening to the slow rising murmur of the gamblers with her thoughts growing clearer she realized it was love of jim and fear for him fear that he would lose her that caused her cold dread and the laboring breath and the weighted heart she had cost jim this terrible experience and she wanted to make up to him for it to give him herself and all her life Joan lay there a long time, thinking and suffering, while the strange, morbid desire to watch Kells and Golden grew stronger and stronger, until it was irresistible. Her fate, her life, lay in the balance between these two men. She divined that. She returned to her vantage point, and as she glanced through, she vibrated to a shock. The change that had begun subtly, intangibly, was now a terrible and glaring difference. That great quantity of gold, the equal chance of every gambler, the marvelous possibilities presented to evil minds, and the hell that hid in the black bottle, these had made playthings of every bandit except Golden. He was exactly the same as ever. But to see the others sent a chill of ice along Joan's veins. Kells was white and wrapped. Plain to see he had won. 
Blicky was wild with rage. Jesse Smith sat darker, grimmer, but no longer cool. There was hate in that glance he fastened upon Kells as he bet. Beady Jones and Braverman showed an inflamed and impotent eagerness to take their turn. Bud sat in the game now, and his face wore a terrible look. Joan could not tell what passion drove him, but she knew he was a loser. Pike and Bossert likewise were losers, and stood apart, sullen, watching with sick, jealous rage. Jim Cleve had reacted to the strain, and he was white, with nervous, clutching hands and piercing glances. And the game went on, with violent slap of card or pound of fist upon the table with the slide of a bag of gold, or the little sodden thump of its weight, with savage curses at loss, and strange, raw exultation at gain, with hurry and violence, more than all, with the wildness of the hour, and the wildness of these men, drawing closer and closer to the dread climax that from the beginning had been foreshadowed. Suddenly Bud rose and bent over the table, his cards clutched in a shaking hand, his face distorted and malignant, his eyes burning at Kells. Passionately, he threw the cards down. There, he yelled hoarsely, and he stilled the noise. No good, replied Kells tauntingly. Is there any other game you play? Bud bent low to see the cards in Kells's hand, and then, straightening his form, he gazed with haggard fury at the winner. You've done me. I'm clean. I'm busted, he raved. You were easy. Get out of the game, replied Kells, with an exultant contempt. It was not the passion of play that now obsessed him, but the passion of success. I said you'd done me, burst out Bud insanely. You're slick with the cards. The accusation acted like magic to silence the bandits, to check movement, to clamp the situation. Kells was white and radiant. He seemed careless and nonchalant. All right, bud, he replied, but his tone did not suit his strange look. That's three times for you. Swift as a flash, he shot. Bud fell over Golden, and the giant, with one sweep of his arm, threw the stricken bandit off. Bud fell heavily and neither moved nor spoke. Pass me the bottle, went on Kells a little hoarse shakiness in his voice, and go on with the game. "'Can I set in now?' asked Beady Jones eagerly. "'You and Jack wait. This is getting to be all between Kells and me,' said Golden. "'We sure got Blicky done,' exclaimed Kells. There was something taunting about the leader's words. He did not care for the gold. It was the fight to win. It was his egotism. Make this game faster and bigger, will you? retorted Blicky, who seemed inflamed. Boss, a little luck makes you lofty, interposed Jesse Smith in dark disdain. Pretty soon you'll show yellow clear to your gizzard. The gold lay there on the table. It was only a means to an end. It signified nothing. The evil, the terrible greed, the brutal lust were in the hearts of the men and hate, liberated, rampant, stalked out, unconcealed, ready for blood. Golden, change the game to suit these gents, taunted Kells. Double stakes, cut the cards, boomed the giant instantly. Blicky lasted only a few more deals of the cards. Then he rose, loser of all his shares, a passionate and venomous bandit, ready for murder. But he kept his mouth shut, and looked wary. "'Boss, can we set in now?' demanded Beatty Jones. "'Say, Beatty, you're in a hurry to lose your gold,' replied Kells. "'Wait till I beat Golden and Smith.' Luck turned against Jesse Smith. He lost first to Golden, then to Kells. And presently he rose, a beaten but game man. He reached for the whiskey. "'Fellas, I reckon I can enjoy Kells's yellow streak more when I ain't playing.' he said. The bandit leader eyed Smith with awakening rancor, as if a persistent hint of the inevitable weakness had its effect. He frowned, and the radiance left his face for the forbidding cast. 
Stand around, you men, and see some real gambling, he said. At this moment in the contest, Kells had twice as much gold as Golden, there being a huge mound of the little buckskin sacks in front of him. They began staking a bag at a time and cutting the cards. The high card winning. Kells won the first four cuts. How strangely that radiance returned to his face. Then he lost and won, and won and lost. The other bandits grouped round, only Jones and Braverman now manifesting any eagerness. All were silent. There were suspense, strain, mystery in the air. Golden began to win consistently, and Kells began to change. It was a sad and strange sight to see this strong man's nerve and force gradually deteriorate under a fickle fortune. The time came when half the amount he had collected was in front of Golden. The giant was imperturbable. He might have been a huge animal, or destiny, or something inhuman, that knew the run of luck would be his. As he had taken losses, so he greeted gains, with absolute indifference. While Kells's hand shook, the giants were steady and slow. And sure, it must have been hateful to Kells, this faculty of Golden's to meet victory identically as he met defeat. The test of a great gambler's nerve was not in sustaining loss, but in remaining cool with victory. That fact grew manifest that Golden was a great gambler and Kells was not. The giant had no emotion, no imagination. Kells seemed all fire and whirling hope and despair and rage. His vanity began to bleed to death. This game was the deciding contest. The scornful and exultant looks of his men proved how that game was going. Again and again, Kells's unsteady hand reached for one of the whiskey bottles. Once with a low curse, he threw an empty bottle through the door. Hey, boss, ain't it about time, began Jesse Smith. But whatever he had intended to say, he thought better of, withholding it. Kells's sudden look and movement were unmistakable. The goddess of chance, as false as the bandit's vanity, played with him. He brightened under a streak of winning. But just as his face began to lose its haggard shade, to glow, the tide again turned against him. He lost and lost. And with each bag of gold dust went something of his spirit. And when he was reduced to his original share, he indeed showed that yellow streak which Jesse Smith had attributed to him. The bandit's effort to pull himself together, to be a man before that scornful gang, was pitiful and futile. He might have been magnificent, confronted by other issues, of peril or circumstance. But there he was craven. He was a man who should never have gambled. One after the other, in quick succession, he lost the two bags of gold his original share. He had lost utterly. Golden had the great heap of dirty little buckskin sack so significant of the hidden power within. Joan was amazed and sick at the sight of Kells then, and if it had been possible, she would have withdrawn her gaze. But she was chained there. The catastrophe was imminent. Kells stared down at the gold. His jaw worked convulsively. He had the eyes of a trapped wolf, yet he seemed not wholly to comprehend what had happened to him. Golden rose, slow, heavy, ponderous, to tower over his heap of gold. Then this giant, who had never shown an emotion, suddenly terribly blazed. One more bet, a cut of the cards, my whole stake of gold, he boomed. The bandits took a stride forward as one man, then stood breathless. One bet, echoed Kells, aghast, against what? Against the girl. Joan sank against the wall, a piercing torture in her breast. She clutched the logs to keep from falling. So that was the impending horror. She could not unrivet her eyes from the paralyzed Kells. Yet she seemed to see Jim Cleve 
leap straight up and then stand equally motionless with Kells. One cut of the cards, my gold against the girl, boomed the giant. Kells made a move as to go for his gun, but it failed. His hand was a shaking leaf. You always bragged on your nerve, went on Golden, mercilessly. You're the gambler of the border. Come on. Kells stood there, his doom upon him. Plain to all was his torture, his weakness, his defeat. It seemed that with all his soul he combated something only to fail. One cut, my gold against your girl. The gang burst into concerted taunt. Like snarling, bristling wolves, they craned their necks at Kells. No, damn you, no, cried Kells, in hoarse, broken fury. With both hands before him, he seemed to push back the sight of that gold, of golden, of the malignant men, of a horrible temptation. Reckon, boss, that yellow streak is operating, sang out Jesse Smith. But neither gold nor golden, nor men nor taunts, ruined Kells at this perhaps most critical crisis of his life. It was the mad, clutching, terrible opportunity presented. It was the strange and terrible nature of the wager. What vision might have flitted through the gambler's mind? But neither vision nor loss nor gain moved him. There, looking like a flame at his soul, consuming the good in him at a blast, overpowering his love, was a strange and magnificent gamble. He could not resist it. Speechless, with a motion of his hand, he signified his willingness. Blicky, shuffle the cards, boomed Golden. Blicky did so, and dropped the deck with a slap in the middle of the table. Cut, called Golden. Kells's shaking hand crept toward the deck. Jim Cleve suddenly appeared to regain power of speech and motion. Don't, Kells, don't, he cried, piercingly, as he leaped forward. But neither Kells nor the others heard him, or even saw his movement. Kells cut the deck. He held up his card. It was the King of Hearts. What a transformation! His face might have been that of a corpse suddenly revivified with glorious, leaping life. Only an ace can beat that, muttered Jesse Smith into the silence. Golden reached for the deck, as if he knew every card left was an ace. His cavernous eyes gloated over Kells. He cut, and before he looked himself, he let Kells see the card. You can't beat my streak, he boomed. Then he threw the card upon the table. It was the ace of spades. Kells seemed to shrivel, to totter, to sink. Jim Cleve went quickly to him, held to him. Kells. Go say good-bye to your girl, boomed Golden. I'll want her pretty soon. Come on, you beady and braver men. Here's your chance to get even. Golden resumed his seat, and the two bandits invited to play were eager to comply, while the others pressed close once more. Jim Cleve led the dazed Kells toward the door into Joan's cabin. For Joan, just then, all seemed to be dark. When she recovered, she was lying on the bed, and Jim was bending over her. He looked frantic with grief and desperation and fear. "'Jim, Jim,' she moaned, grasping his hands. He helped her to sit up. Then he saw Kells standing there. He looked abject, stupid, drunk. Yet evidently he had begun to comprehend the meaning of his deed. "'Kells,' began Cleve, in low, hoarse tones as he stepped forward with a gun. I'm going to kill you and Joan and myself. Kells stared at Cleve. Go ahead, kill me, and kill the girl, too. That'll be better for her now, but why kill yourself? I love her. She's my wife. The deadness about Kells suddenly changed. Joan flung herself before him. Kells, listen, she whispered, in swift, broken passion. Jim Cleve was my sweetheart back in Hodley. We quarreled. I taunted him. I said he hadn't nerve enough even to be bad. He left me bitterly enraged. Next day I trailed him. I wanted to fetch him back. You remember. 
how you met me with Roberts, how you killed Roberts, and all the rest. When Jim and I met out here, I was afraid to tell you. I tried to influence him. I succeeded. Till we got to Alder Creek. Then he went wild. I married him, hoping to steady him. Then the day of lynching, we were separated from you in the crowd. That night we hid, and next morning took the stage. Golden and his gang held up the stage. They thought you had put us there. We fooled them. But we had to come on here to Cabin Gulch, hoping to tell that you'd let us go. And now, now... Joan had not strength to go on. The thought of Golden made her faint. It's true, Kells added Cleve passionately as he faced the incredulous bandit. I swear it. Why, you ought to see now. My God, boy, I do see, gasped Kells, the dark, sodden thickness of comprehension and feeling indicative of the hold of drink passed away swiftly. The shock had sobered him. Instantly, Joan saw it, saw in him the return of the other and better Kells, now stricken with remorse. She slipped to her knees and clasped her arms around him. He tried to break her hold, but she held on. Get up, he ordered violently. Jim, pull her away. Girl, don't do that in front of me. I've just gambled away. Her life, Kells, only that, I swear, cried Cleve. Kells, listen, began Joan pleadingly. You will not let that, that cannibal have me? No, by God, replied Kells sickly. I was drunk, crazy. Forgive me, girl. You see, how did I know what was coming? Oh, the whole thing is hellish. You loved me once, whispered Joan softly. Do you love me still? Kells, can't you see? It's not too late to save my life and your soul. Can't you see? You have been bad. But if you save me now from Golden, save me for this boy I've almost ruined, you, you, God will forgive you. Take us away, go with us, and never come back to the border. Maybe I can save you, he muttered, as if to himself. He appeared to want to think, but to be bothered by the clinging arms around him. Joan felt a ripple go over his body, and he seemed to heighten, and the touch of his hands thrilled. Then, white and appealing, Cleve added his importunity. Kells, I saved your life once. You said you'd remember it some day. Now, now. For God's sakes, don't make me shoot her. Joan rose from her knees, but she still clasped Kells. She seemed to feel the mounting of his spirit, to understand how in this moment he was rising out of the depths. How strangely glad she was for him. Joan, once you showed me what the love of a good woman really was. I've never seen the same since then. I've grown better in one way, worse in all others. I let down. I was no man for the border. Always that haunted me. Believe me, won't you, despite all? Joan felt the yearning in him for what he dared not ask. She read his mind. She knew he meant, somehow, to atone for his wrong. I'll show you again, she whispered. I'll tell you more. If I'd never loved Jim Cleve, if I'd met you, I'd have loved you. And bandit or not, I would have gone with you to the end of the world. Joan, the name was almost a sob of joy and pain. Sight of his face then blinded Joan with her tears. But when he caught her to him, in a violence that was a terrible renunciation, she gave her embrace, her arms, her lips, without the vestige of a lie, with all of the womanliness and sweetness and love and passion. He let her go and turned away, and in that instant Joan had a final divination that this strange man could rise once to the heights as supreme as the depths of his soul were dark. She dashed away her tears and wiped the dimness from her eyes. Hope resurged. Something strong and sweet gave her strength. When Kells wheeled, he was the Kells of her earlier experience. Cool, easy, deadly, with a smile almost amiable. 
and the strange, pale eyes. Only the white radiance of him was different. He did not look at her. Jim, will you do exactly what I tell you? Yes, I promise, replied Jim. How many guns do you have? Two. Give me one of them. Cleve held out the gun that all the while he had kept in his hand. Kells took it and put it in his pocket. Pull your other gun. Be ready, said he swiftly. But don't you shoot once till I go down. Then do your best. Save the last bullet for Joan, in case. I promise, replied Cleve steadily. Then Kells drew a knife from a sheath at his belt. It had a long, bright blade. Joan had seen him use it many a time round the campfire. He slipped the blade up his sleeve, retaining the haft of the knife in his hand. He did not speak another word, nor did he glance at Joan again. She had felt his gaze while she had embraced him, as she raised her lips. That look had been his last. Then he went out. Jim knelt beside the door, peering between post and curtain. Joan staggered to the chink between the logs. She would see that fight if it froze her blood, the very marrow of her bones. The gamblers were intent upon their game. Not a dark face looked up as Kells sauntered toward the table. Golden sat with his back to the door. There was a shaft of sunlight streaming in, and Kells blocked it, sending a shadow over the bent heads of the gamesters. How significant that shadow, a blackness barring gold. Still no one paid any attention to Kells. He stepped closer. Suddenly he leaped into swift and terrible violence. Then with a lunge he drove the knife into Golden's burly neck. Up heaved the giant, his mighty force overturning the table, and benches and men. An awful boom, strangely distorted, and split burst from him. Then Kells blocked the door with a gun in each hand, but only the one in his right hand spurted white and red. Instantly there followed a mad scramble, hoarse yells over which that awful roar of Golden's predominated, and the bang of guns. Clouds of white smoke veiled the scene, and with every shot the veil grew denser. Red flashes burst from the ground where men were down, and from each side of Kells. His form seemed less instinctive with force. It had shortened. He was sagging. But at intervals the red spurt and report of his gun showed he was fighting. Then a volley from one side made him stagger against the door. The clear spang of a Winchester spoke above the heavy boom of the guns. Joan's eyesight recovered from his blur or else the haze of smoke drifted, for she saw better. Golden's action fascinated her, horrified her. He had evidently gone crazy. He groped about the room, through the smoke, to and fro before the fighting, yelling bandits, grasping with huge hands for something. His sense of direction, his equilibrium had become affected. His awful roar still sounded above the din but it was weakening. His giant's strength was weakening. His legs bent and buckled under him. All at once he whipped out his two big guns and began to fire as he staggered, at random. He killed the wounded Blicky. In the melee he ran against Jesse Smith and thrust both guns at him. Jesse saw the peril, and with a shriek he fired point-blank at Golden. Then as Golden pulled triggers, both men fell. But Golden rose, bloody-browed, bawling, still a terrible engine of destruction. He seemed to glare in one direction and shoot in another. He pointed the guns and apparently pulled the triggers long after the shots had all been fired. Kells was on his knees now with only one gun. This wavered and fell, wavered and fell. His left arm hung broken but his face flashed white through the thin, drifting clouds of smoke. Besides Golden, the bandit Pike was the only one not down, and he was hard hit. When he shot his last, he threw the gun away, and drawing a knife, 
he made at Kells. Kells shot once more and hit Pike, but did not stop him. Silence, after the shots and yells, seemed weird, and the groping giant trying to follow Pike resembled a huge phantom. With one wrench, he tore off a leg of an overturned table and brandished that. He swayed now, and there was a whistle where before there had been a roar. Pike fell over the body of Blicky and got up again. The bandit leader staggered to his feet, flung the useless gun in Pike's face, and closed with him in weak but final combat. They lurched and careened to and fro, with the giant Golden swaying after them. Thus they struggled until Pike moved under Golden's swinging club. The impetus of the blow carried Golden off his balance. Kells seized the haft of the knife still protruding from the giant's neck, and he pulled upon it with all his might. Golden heaved up again, and the movement enabled Kells to pull out the knife. A bursting gush of blood, thick and heavy, went flooding before the giant as he fell. Kells dropped the knife and, tottering, surveyed the scene before him, the gasping Golden and all the quiet forms. Then he made a few halting steps and dropped near the door. Joan tried to rush out, but what with the unsteadiness of her limbs and Jim holding her, as he went out, too, she seemed long in getting the Kells. She knelt beside him, lifted his head. His face was white. His eyes were open. But they were only the windows of a retreating soul. He did not know her. Consciousness was gone. Then swiftly, life fled. End of chapter 19 Chapter 20 of the Border Legion by Zane Gray. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Cleve steadied Joan in her saddle and stood a moment beside her, holding her hands. The darkness seemed clearing before her eyes, and the sick pain within her seemed numbing out. Brace up, hang to your saddle, Jim was saying earnestly. Any moment, some of the other bandits might come. You lead the way. I'll follow and drive the pack horse. But, Jim, I'll never be able to find the back trail, said Joan. I think you will. You'll remember every yard of the trail on which you were brought in here. You won't realize that till you see. Joan started and did not look back. Cabin Gulch was like a place in a dream. It was a relief when she rode out into the broad valley. The grazing horses lifted their heads to whistle. Joan saw the clumps of bushes and the flowers, the waving grass, but never as she had seen them before. How strange that she knew exactly which way to turn, to head, to cross. She trotted her horse so fast that Jim called to say he could not drive a pack animal and keep to her gait. Every rod of the trail lessened a burden. Behind was something hideous and incomprehensible and terrible. Before beckoned something beginning to seem bright. And it was not the ruddy, calm sunset flooding the hills with color. That something called from beyond the hills. She led straight to a campsite she remembered long before she came to it. And the charred logs of the fire, the rocks, the tree under which she had lain, all brought back the emotions she had felt there. She grew afraid of the twilight, and when night settled down, there were phantoms stalking in the shadows. When Cleve, in his hurried camp duties, went out of her sight, she wanted to cry out to him, but had not the voice. And when he was close, still she trembled and was cold. He wrapped blankets round her, and held her in his arms. Yet the numb chill and the dark clamp of mind remained with her. Long she lay awake. The stars were pitiless. When she shut her eyes, the blackness seemed unendurable. She slept 
to wake out of nightmare, and she dared sleep no more. At last the day came. For Joan that faint trail seemed a broad road, blazoned through the wild canyons and up the rocky fastness, and through the thick brakes. She led on and on, and up and down, never at fault, with familiar landmarks near and far. Cleve hung close to her, and now his call to her, or to the pack-horse, took on a keener note. Every rough and wild mile behind them meant so much. They did not halt at the noon hour. They did not halt at the next campsite, still more darkly memorable to Joan. And sunset found them miles farther on, down on the divide, at the head of Lost Canyon. Here Joan ate and drank, and slept the deep sleep of exhaustion. Sunrise found them moving, and through the winding, wild canyon they made fast travel. Both time and miles passed swiftly. At noon they reached the little open cabin, and they dismounted for a rest and a drink at the spring. Joan did not speak a word here. That she could look into the cabin, where she had almost killed a bandit, and then, through silent, lonely weeks, had nursed him back to life, was a proof that the long ride and the distance were helping her, sloughing away the dark deadlock to hope and brightness. They left the place exactly as they had found it, except that Cleve plucked the card from the bark of the balsam tree, golden ace of hearts, target with its bullet holes. Then they rode on, out of that canyon, over the rocky ridge, down into another canyon, and on and on, past an old campsite, along a babbling brook for miles, and so at last out into the foothills. Toward noon of the next day, when approaching a clump of low trees in a flat valley, Joan pointed ahead. Jim, it was in there where Roberts and I camped, and... You ride around, I'll catch up with you, replied Cleve. She made a wide detour to come back again to her own trail, so different here. Presently Cleve joined her. His face was pale and sweaty, and he looked sick. They rode on silently, and that night they camped without water on her own trail, made months before. The single tracks were there, sharp and clear in the earth, as if imprinted but a day. Next morning Joan found that as the wild border lay behind her, so did the dark and hateful shadow of gloom. Only the pain remained, and it had softened. She could think now. Jim Cleve cheered up. Perhaps it was her brightening to which she responded. They began to talk, and speech liberated feeling. Miles of that back trail they rode side by side, holding hands, driving the pack horse ahead, and beginning to talk of old associations. Again it was sunset when they rode down the hill towards the little village of Hodley. Joan's heart was full, but Jim was gay. Won't I have it on your old fellows, he teased, but he was grim, too. Jim, you won't tell just yet, she faltered. I'll introduce you as my wife. They'll all think we eloped. No, they'll say I ran after you. Please, Jim. Keep it a secret a little. It'll be hard for me. Aunt Jane will never understand. Well, I'll keep it a secret till you want to tell. For two things, he said. What? Meet me tonight under the spruces where we had that quarrel. Meet just like we did then, but differently. Will you? I'll be so glad. And put on your mask now. You know, Joan, sooner or later... Your story will be on everybody's tongue. You'll be Dandy Dale as long as you live near this border. Wear the mask just for fun. Imagine your Aunt Jane and everybody. Jim, I'd forgotten how I look, exclaimed Joan in dismay. I didn't bring your long coat. Oh, I can't face them in this suit. You'll have to. Besides, you look great. It's going to tickle me, the sensation you'll make. Don't you see? They'll never recognize you till you take the mask off. Please, Joan. She yielded, 
and don the black mask, not without a twinge. And thus they rode across the log bridge, over the creek, into the village. The few men and women they met stared in wonder, and recognizing Cleve, they grew excited. They followed, and others joined them. Joan, won't it be strange if Uncle Ben's really is the overland of Alder Creek? We've packed out every pound of overland's gold. Oh, I hope, I believe he's your uncle. Wouldn't it be great, Joan? But Joan could not answer. The word gold was a stab. Besides, she saw Aunt Jane and two neighbors standing before a log cabin, beginning to show signs of interest in the approaching procession. Joan fell back a little, trying to screen herself behind Jim. Then Jim halted with a cheery salute. "'For land's sakes!' ejaculated a sweet-faced, gray-haired woman. "'If it isn't Jim Cleve!' cried another. Jim jumped off and hugged the first speaker. She seemed overjoyed to see him and then overcome. Her face began to work. "'Jim, we always hoped you'd—' you'd fetch Joan back. Sure, shouted Jim, who had no heart now for even an instant's deception. There she is. Who? What? Joan slipped out of her saddle, and, tearing off the mask, she leaped forward with a little sob. Ante, Ante, it's Joan, alive and well. Oh, so glad to be home. Don't look at my clothes, look at me. Aunt Jane evidently sustained a shock of recognition joy, amaze, consternation, and shame, all of which were subservient to the joy. She cried over Joan and murmured over her. Then, suddenly alive to the curious crowd, she put Joan from her. You, you wild thing, you desperado. I always told Bill you'd run wild some day. March in the house and get out of that indecent rig. That night under the spruces, with the starlight piercing the lacy shadows, Joan waited for Jim Cleve. It was one of the white, silent mountain nights. The brook murmured over the stones, and the wind rustled the branches. The wonder of Joan's homecoming was in learning that Uncle Bill Hodley was indeed Overland, the discoverer of Alder Creek. Years and years of profitless toil had at last been rewarded in this rich gold strike. Joan hated to think of gold. She had wanted to leave the gold back in Cabin Gulch, and she would have done so had Jim permitted it, and to think that all that gold which was not Jim Cleve's belonged to her uncle. She could not believe it. Fatal and terrible forever to Joan would be the significance of gold. Did any woman in the world or any man know the meaning of gold as well as she knew it? How strange and enlightening and terrible had been her experience. She had grown now, not to blame any man, honest miner or bloody bandit. She blamed only gold. She doubted its value. She could not see it a blessing. She absolutely knew its driving power to change the souls of men. Could she ever forget that vast anthill of toiling diggers and washers, blind and deaf and dumb to all save gold, always limbed in figures of fire against the black memory, would be the forms of those wild and violent bandits. Golden, the monster, the gorilla, the cannibal. Horrible as was the memory of him, there was no horror in thought of his terrible death. That seemed to be the one memory that did not hurt. But Kells was indestructible. He lived in her mind. Safe out of the border now and at home, she could look back clearly. Still, all was not clear and never would be. She saw Kells, the ruthless bandit, the organizer, the planner, and the blood spiller. He ought to have no place in a good woman's memory, yet he had. She never condoned one of his deeds or even his intentions. She knew her intelligence was not broad enough to grasp the vastness of his guilt. She believed he must have been the worst and most terrible character on that wild border. That border had developed him. It had produced the time and place and the man. 
and therein lay the mystery. For over against this bandit's weakness and evil, she could contrast strength and nobility. She alone had known the real man in all the strange phases of his nature, and the darkness of his crime faded out of her mind. She suffered remorse, almost regret, yet what could she have done? There had been no help for that impossible situation as there was now no help for her in a right and just placing of Kells among men. He had stolen her, wantonly murdering for the sake of lonely, fruitless hours with her. He had loved her, and he had changed. He had gambled away her soul and life. And last, and terrible proof of the evil power of gold, and in the end he had saved her. He had gone from her white, radiant cool, with strange, pale eyes, and his amiable, mocking smile, and all the ruthless force of his life had expended itself in one last magnificent stand. If only he had known her at the end when she lifted his head. But no, there had been only the fading light, the strange weird look of a retreating soul, already alone forever. A rustling of leaves, a step, thrilled Joan out of her meditation. Suddenly she was seized from behind, and Jim Cleve showed that though he might be a joyous and grateful lover, he certainly would never be an actor. For if he desired to live over again that fatal meeting and quarrel which had sent them out to the border, he failed utterly in his part. There was possession in the gentle grasp of his arms and bliss in the trembling of his lips. Jim, you never did it that way, laughed Joan. If you had, do you think I could ever have been furious? Jim in turn laughed happily. Joan, that's exactly the way I stole upon you and mauled you. You think so? Well, I happen to remember. Now you sit here and make believe you're Joan, and let me be Jim Cleve. I'll show you. She stole away into the darkness, and noiselessly, as a shadow, she stole back to enact that violent scene as if it lived in her memory. Jim was breathless, speechless, choked. That's how you treated me, she said. I don't believe I could have been such a, a bear, panted Jim. But you were, and consider I've not half your strength. Then all I say is, you did right to drive me off. Only, you should never have trailed me out to the border. Ah, but Jim, in my fury, I discovered my love. End of chapter 20 End of the Border Legion by Zane Gray Recording by Richard Kilmer, San Antonio, Texas